And so for this morning's message, we are actually going to start with, and really throughout the whole message, we're going to start with a story. And this story is very famous. I mean, like non-Christians know this story. And it's a story in the Bible. And the story in the Bible is called Jonah. Jonah. And probably the moment that I probably said Jonah, you probably think of A, the big fish, B, Jonah getting swallowed by the big fish. And if you grew up in church, like in the kids' ministry, you probably had a drawing picture of it. Like I remember as a kid, I would have the sheet of paper and Jonah and the big fish. And like the teacher would tell us, all right, kids, now draw in between the lines. I tried my best, y'all, but I took the crayons. I tried to color in between the lines. I couldn't. And I would show it to my mom. I'm like, look, mom, look at this amazing art piece. And she's like, honey, <laughs> you did your best. I'm not an artist. Stick figures is the way to go. If, if you agree, go ahead and say amen or type in amen. But I'm not an artist whatsoever. But the story of Jonah, almost everyone remembers the story of Jonah because of the big fish. But can I tell you that if, all, if that's all you focus on, you're actually missing the bigger picture. Because the big fish and Jonah getting swallowed by a fish is only just a side piece of the story of Jonah. That's not the full story. When we look at Jesus, who, who, who is the savior of the world, he didn't just do miracles. There, there, there's different meanings and different purposes in his miracles. Like he wouldn't just heal people and said, okay, you're healed. He healed people to, to use it as an example. He healed people to have a deeper meaning or a deeper purpose behind it. And it's just like the story of Jonah. Like, yes, the big fish seems like the main part of the story, but it's really not. And so this morning... I would like us to dive into the actual story of Jonah. I'm not saying that he wasn't swallowed by a big fish, but I want to go to the full story. I want to expand just one episode or one scene and view the full story. And in order for us to view the full story, we got to start in chapter one. But before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. God, Lord, thank you so much for this morning. God, Lord, I just pray that I will get out of the way and that you will preach and teach through me. And Lord, I just pray that whoever is listening to this, God, that they will receive your word loud and clear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So hey, we're going to go ahead and start in Jonah chapter 1, which I think is right for us to start in chapter 1 if we want to look at the full story. So in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So already in these first three verses, we see the beginning of the story. We see Jonah being called by God. Jonah is being called by God to this mission. And what was the mission? If we go back to the verse, the mission was to go to this great city in Nineveh and call out against it. Basically, God is calling Jonah, hey, I want you to go to this city and I want you to preach the message of repentance. I want this city to repent from its evil way. And immediately, verse three, Jonah goes to the opposite direction. Jonah goes to Tarshish. Jonah's like, nah, I'm not doing that. And my first question is like, why? Why? Like, why did Jonah do this? Why did he just up and leave? Well, right now, as we're reading the story for what it is, the story doesn't tell us yet. It tells us later down this chapters. But for right now, all we can see here is that Jonah has made his first mistake. And Jonah's first mistake is that he disobeyed God. God specifically called him to go and to spread the word of repentance to this city. It was a mission. It was purposeful. And Jonah just simply disobeyed. And we can look at the story and say, like, wow, Jonah, like, why would you do that? Why would you just disobey God? Like, God's way, come on, you know that God's way is better. You know that God's plan is perfect. Come on, like, why would you do that, Jonah? And we can sit there and ask that question all day long. But if we take a step back, we can actually steer ourselves to this as well. There's been many times where we've disobeyed God. There's been many times where we've also made our first mistake in life, which is to disobey God. 
Think about Adam and Eve. I mean, the, the, when sin entered the world, it came from disobedience. And as much as we can look at Jonah and say, I can't believe you disobeyed God. Let's look at our life. Many times we have the choice to obey God and what he's called us to do, but we choose not to do it. Maybe it's because you want to do what you want to do and you want to follow your fleshly desires. Maybe it's because whatever situation you're in. But, but most of us, all of us have, have disobeyed God at some point in life. And we, as a church, we have to realize that we cannot be like Jonah in this situation. If God is calling us to do something, let's not be our first mistake, be disobedience. But let's, our, let's let make our first response, obedience. Like when it comes to 21 days of prayer and fasting, if you've been um, a part of our church, you know that we have started 21 days of prayer and fasting, and we actually just finished up the first week of prayer and fasting. And a side note, for those who are doing the prayer and fasting, I hope everything is going well. I hope, you know, everything is good and you're experiencing God's peace and you're experiencing something new. Um, for me personally, I'm fasting from fast food. And it's not only because the Lord called me to do that, but it's because I think the Lord and I both know that I'm addicted to fast food. The Chick-fil-A that is on Portsmouth Boulevard, everyone knows me. The workers know me. Like, and I, and I used to work there, yes. But even outside of that, the new workers who've come up, they know my name. And I tell the students all the time, I'm like, listen, y'all don't have no idea how addicted I am to Chick-fil-A. And they're like, oh, you're just joking about it. And I took one of my students there the other day and he was like, wow, they really do know you. <laughs> but I know that I was addicted from fast food and I know I had to take a break and, and fast from it. And um, as I was driving home one day from school, I saw that very same Chick-fil-A. I saw that the line was not as long and the, and the sign for, for the Chick-fil-A was just shining like really bright. And I don't know if my mouth was drooling. I don't know if like, you know, how the cartoons had the mouth drooling, but like I was like craving Chick-fil-A. And I had the choice right then and there to either disobey God and what he's calling me to do and just, you know, go in the drive-thru or I had the opportunity to continue to obey God and continue to where he's called me to be. And I know that's a silly example, but there's so many times in our life where God is calling us either to reach people, to love people, to invite people to church, and we are hesitant to do it. And we end up disobeying God, and we, and we end up not doing it. But let's, let's, let's not make that mistake in our life, because we know that God's way is always better. Despite whatever reason you may want to disobey God, just know that God's way is perfect. He's an all-knowing God. No matter what you're going through in life, the more that you obey God and the more that you follow his will and the more aligned that you are with his heart, the better life will be. I'm not saying that things won't come up that, that, that aren't easy. Life is hard. But the more that you obey God and follow his will, the more that you experience his peace, the more that you experience his love, the closer you get in your relationship with God. But for Jonah, Jonah just disobeyed. And Jonah is actively running away from God. And so in the next verse, we get to see what happens. Verse four, it says, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. So here we see God's response to Jonah's disobedience. And God's response is him in this context, God's response is starting this storm because Jonah's on a ship. And as Jonah is on his ship and he's heading the opposite direction from where he's supposed to go, from where he's called to go, God is causing this storm to interrupt that process. And at first glance, you may view this as cruel. Like, hey, God, why would you stir up this storm? Like, you know, like, just let Jonah go. But I don't see this as God being cruel. I think we should see this as God actually giving Jonah a second chance. God could have easily said, okay, Jonah, you disobey me. Well, I'm just going to move on from you. I'm going to choose somebody else to do this. God could have easily, easily moved on. God could have not even mentioned Jonah anymore. But God still was chasing after Jonah and said, no, 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 Jonah, you're not going to run away like that. I still love you. I still want you. I still want to use you for this mission and this purpose, even though you disobeyed. And church, I want you to know that even though you've even though we've all disobeyed God at some point, 
And maybe right now you're in a season of disobedience or you're in a season where you feel distant from God. I want you to know that you're never too far gone from coming back to God. You're never too far gone. God, does, God just doesn't leave you hanging with his arms folded like, yep, you're too far gone. You've made too many mistakes. You've disobeyed me too many times. Like, no, that's not at all true. We see here in this story, God is not leaving Jonah alone. He's actually running towards Jonah. And this is a clear reminder that even though we make mistakes in life and we've disobeyed God in the past, that we can come to God with forgiveness. We can come, we can come to a God with a loving heart who will accept us despite the fact that we are sinners. And I think this is a moment just to praise and thank God for him to give us these second chances in life. Even though we've disobeyed God, even though we may go distant, we know that we can always go to God who has his arms wide open, ready for us. And for Jonah, Jonah realizes that. Jonah realizes what is happening and why this storm is taking place. And so Jonah tells the sailors, the sailors, you know, they're also in the boat. So they're freaking out. They're like, what is going on? Like, why is this storm happening? And so they go wake up Jonah because Jonah was actually asleep in the boat. They go wake up Jonah. They're like, listen, you got to call out to your God because I have no clue what's happening. Like this storm, the ship is threatening to break. And Jonah tells the sailors in verse 12, he said to them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah knows that this is God calling him out, basically. Jonah knows that this is God. So he tells the sailors, he's like, all right, look, here's the solution. Just throw me off the boat. And so the sailors, they throw Jonah off the boat. And then that's where we get Jonah being swallowed by a big fish. So now Jonah has an opportunity to respond. Jonah has an opportunity to repent. Jonah has an opportunity right here to turn his ways. You know, at this point in the story, like, you know, we can see Jonah finally repent and say, you know what, God, I've been running from you. I've been going distant from you, but I'm going to turn because that's what repentance is. It's turning from one direction of being disobedient from God and it's going the other direction to being obedient to God. And, you know, I would wish in this story that we can see Jonah really do that. You know, Jonah's going to repent. Jonah's going to change his ways. He's going to obey God with a joyful heart. He's going to be so happy to do it. I don't know in this next chapter if he really truly repents. Because like we talked about, repentance is turning from one direction to the other. And that's why we go into this next segment of Jonah's repentance. And I have it in quotations because as we read here in a bit, I want us to start thinking, is Jonah's prayer really a repentance? Is he really saying, God, I'm sorry for, for going distant from you. Now I'm going to turn my way and I'm going to follow you with a joyful heart. And, I, and I'm going to seek your will. Let's find out. In Jonah chapter two, and this chapter is just 10 verses. It says this, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Okay. Out of the belly of Shiloh, I cried, and you've heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of seas, and the flood surrounded me. All of your waves and billows passed over me. And then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look again, look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. Oh Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard in vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So in this chapter, Jonah is saying, you know, God, I'm thankful for you that, you know, you didn't basically end my life. 
Jonah recognizes who God is. But in this prayer, there's one word that is repeated 12 times. And that is the word me. 12 times, and again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so maybe if you're reading from either KJV or NIV, it may be different. But Jonah mentions the word me 12 times. And he's mentioning me in a standpoint of, God, can you please just get me out of this situation? He's describing what's around him. He's describing the seas. He's describing that he's in a fish. So Jonah's not really praying, God, I'm sorry, Lord. I want to turn to you. I want to obey you with a joyful heart. No, no, no. Jonah is really saying, God, I look where I am around me, and I really want to get out. I recognize how great you are. Because of how great you are, can I please get out of this situation? So Jonah's not really repenting. Jonah's kind of really using God as a genie. Like, hey, God, can you please just get me out of this situation? Like, I know I put myself in this situation, but can you please just take me out? And I think that's also some of us when we pray. When we know that we've been disobedient, we know we've been distant from God. And instead of going to him in repentance, instead of going to him and turning one direction and going to the other, we just say, hey, God, right now I'm going through a tough time. Can you just take me out? Can you just get me out of this rough situation? God, I know I've been disobedient and distant from you, but like, I'm just really going through a rough time. If you can get me out of this rough time, then I'll obey you. When in reality, church, we have to change our prayer. Our prayer should not be, Lord, take me out of this situation. But our prayer should be, Lord, change my heart to learn to obey you more. Because I feel like so oftentimes when we're in situations where we're disobedient to God and we're distant from him, we start to find all the other blame from different places. Well, the reason I've been disobeying God is because, you know, this situation happened in my life and this situation happened in my life. And I'm not whatsoever disregarding those situations that you may be going through. But what I know that is that God's plan is always better. God's plan is perfect. And God doesn't call us to obey him to, to go do this plan that God has called us to do that's bad. No, everything that God has called us to do and asked us to do to obey him, it's pleasing and perfect and for his will. And as Christians, we should not be praying, God, take me out of this situation. We should be praying, God, Lord, change my heart to repent so that I can obey you more. Because the more that we obey God, the more we experience his peace, the more that we experience his love, the more that we are aligned with his heart. You know, we, get, we, we are in a series of God's heart for you. And one of the ways to align your heart with God's heart is to obey his will. And if our prayer life isn't about repenting and turning from our human flesh nature and, and going to him, then what is it? Are we like Jonah right now and we're just praying selfishly and we're praying to God, hey God, just please get me out of this situation right now. Like, I'll obey you, but just, just please get me out of this situation. Or is your prayer life, a prayer life of repentance and a prayer life of, of wanting transformation to happen in your heart? Because in this next part of the story, we get to see Jonah's heart. And Jonah, after praying, and after, you know, having this prayer of quote-unquote repentance, in verse 10, it says, The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So even though Jonah didn't really truly repent, God vomited Jonah, God vomited Jonah out of the fish. Vomited. I don't know. It's a weird word. But, like, you know, he, he got spit out the fish. And so now Jonah's on dry land. And this is an opportunity for us to really look at Jonah's heart. And the thing about Jonah's heart is this whole time that we've read this story, we still haven't figured out why Jonah disobeyed. But all we know right now is that Jonah is about to head to the city of Nineveh. Like God gave him a second chance. God's like, okay, I'm gonna spit you out of this fish. I still want you to go to this great city of Nineveh and preach the word of repentance. And so Jonah finally agrees, but I don't think that Jonah is having a joyful heart while doing this. So let's see how Jonah responds to how he preaches the message of repentance. 
So in Jonah chapter three, we see that Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. He called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse five, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king in Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published to Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything and let them not feed or drink water, but let the man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call mightily to God and let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence that is in his hands. You just see what happened? This whole time that Jonah's been running away and being disobedient, you know, he was distant, and he finally gets to the city that God has been calling him since chapter one. This city repents immediately, like with no hesitation. Jonah just could have done this in chapter one and the people would have repented immediately. And we see here that not only did the people repent, but the whole city, including the king. And the king is saying, listen, like we will call out to the mighty God and they're going to turn away from their evil. Later on in the verse, it says that God saw their repentance and showed mercy and grace to them. And that resulted in God not overthrowing the city. Basically, God saw the people. He saw the people repent. He saw the people turn their ways and God forgave them and showed mercy. And he did not overthrow the city. Jonah should be happy, right? You know, the people repented. Like, this is awesome. Like, come on, Jonah. Like, what's your response to this? But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me for it is better for me to die than to live. So if we go back, we see the exact reason of why Jonah disobeyed. Jonah left to go to Tarshish because he knew that God was going to save those people. Jonah disobeyed God because he knew he was able to save those people who are cruel in Nineveh. Wow. For me, thinking about Jonah, and maybe you thinking about Jonah, you usually just think about the big fish and you never think about Jonah's actual heart in this story. Jonah's heart is bitter. It's filled with anger. So much so that he was so angry at the people of Nineveh, so bitter at the people of Nineveh that he wanted to go the opposite direction. God called him. He said, listen, I want you to preach to the city. He's like, no, I'm angry at those people. I don't want those people to experience mercy. I don't want those people to experience love. And so that's exactly why Jonah disobeyed God. And we can look at this story and be like, Jonah, like, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you letting anger and bitterness consume you like this? But church, don't we do the same thing sometimes? Don't we disobey God because some people have hurt us? Because we don't want some people to experience God's love? I know it's a heavy topic, but there's been many moments in my life where I've let my bitterness and anger control my life. Whether God was calling me to invite someone to church or, or to love that person in school, and I chose not to because I was bitter and angry at that person, or I didn't like that person at work, or, or, or that person, or I said to myself, that person didn't deserve that type of love. And that was the reason of why I would disobey God. And maybe that's you today. Maybe the reason that you're disobeying God and you're not, you know, what God has called us to do, God has called us to what? To love others as we love ourselves. That's the command. God tells us to obey that. And maybe the reason that you're not obeying that is because you're so filled with bitterness 
and angry towards those people. And you say, no, those people don't deserve God's love. Those people don't deserve God's mercy. Can I ask you this question? Didn't God still love us while we were still sinners? I'm standing here, you know, preaching and you know, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but before I was saved, I was a wreck. You know, I just followed the crowd, did what everyone else did. I was no better than anybody else. How can we sit up here as Christians and, 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 say, that, and say that we were not once those people who made those types of mistakes? Christ died for us while we were still sinners, while we still made mistakes. How can we sit up here and tell, and tell ourselves, yeah, those people don't deserve God's love. Oh, those people don't deserve God's mercy. We don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve God's mercy. Nobody does, but God still loves us. God still shows us grace. God still shows us mercy. And there's no reason for us to disobey God. There's no reason for us to grow distant from him, you know, because of our bitterness, of our anger. No, God has called us to love those people, so we're going to go love those people. And it's something that has convicted me for so long that I've seen people in church for years ignore certain people and ignore telling them about the gospel and ignore loving those people because they're in their personal life. They just don't personally like them. Church, we have to realize if God is telling us to love people, it is for a purpose. And that purpose is to reach those people to Jesus. The same Jesus that saved you is the same Jesus that can save them. And we have to learn, church, that we cannot let our personal feelings and our personal bitterness and anger get in the way of obeying what God has called us to do. We have to learn to obey with a joyful heart. And in this story, Jonah doesn't really obey with a joyful heart. He's bitter. He's angry. And, and, and God's response to this anger, he asks this question. Do you do well to be angry? Jonah actually doesn't respond. It says that Jonah just went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade until he should see what would become of the city. So not only is Jonah filled with anger and bitterness, this anger and bitterness is actually weighing him down so much so that he just sits outside of the city and waits for the city to be destroyed. Like he's wanting Nineveh to perish. But God showed mercy to the city. And, and, and Jonah's waiting and waiting. He's like, all right, is this city going to like be destroyed? Like what's going to go on? And, but God showed mercy to the city, so it's not. It won't be destroyed. And in the next verse, it shows God does something with Jonah. God appointed a plant and made it come over Jonah so that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. When dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. So God basically put a plant over Jonah that gave him cool so his head was not burning. Jonah's like, oh, thank you. Like, I appreciate it. That's the least you could do because I'm so angry and so <laughs> filled with bitterness. But then God puts a worm and so it attacks the plant. So now the plant is dead. And then God appointing, and not only is the plant dead, so there's no cover for the heat, God also appointed a scorching wind so that the sun would beat down on the head of Jonah. And he asked that he might die because of this. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, again, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Jonah finally responds. He says, yes, yes, I do to be angry. I am angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know from their right hand to their left? 
and also much cattle. And the story ends there. Kind of a cliffhanger, right? See this conversation between God and Jonah. God's like, listen, do you do well being angry? And Jonah's like, yes, I'm angry enough to die. I'm angry about this. And God asked him the question, and listen, I showed pity for the plant. How come I can't show pity for these people? And the story just ends there like that cliffhanger. And for me, I was shocked because like if I flipped through my Bible, there's like this empty space. I'm like, like, wait, where's the rest of the story? Like, come on, I want to see like Jonah's feedback. I want to see what Jonah says. But the point of the story isn't about what Jonah says. And the point of the story isn't about the people of Nineveh. The point of the story is about us. In our hearts, God is asking us that same very question. Do we show mercy and grace and love to those people who have hurt us? Do we continue to obey God with a joyful heart, even though the situations that we go through are tough? God is asking us that very same question. In this whole story of Jonah, I've made four points. Jonah's first mistake God's response to Jonah's disobedience, Jonah's repentance, and Jonah's heart. I can go through each four of those points and I can replace the word Jonah with my name. And you could probably replace the word Jonah also with your name, with our name. (laughs) My first mistake. (laughs) I don't have really time to go into my testimony. I've, I know I've shared it before with the church, but I mean, I was a wreck. I, I was trying to stray away from God. I was being disobedient. But God, God responded to my disobedience and he came after me. He didn't let go of me. And then I thought to myself like, okay, like, you know, if I can just get out of these situations in life and then I'll follow God. But no, no, God says, no, I want to transform your heart. And God transformed my heart. And now I'm a new creation in Christ. Like we can take any aspect of the story of Jonah into our life. But I want us to really focus on this one main point and this one main question. Because I know I've mentioned obedience a lot. And the main question I want you guys to get is, are you obeying the Lord with a joyful heart? This whole story, we see Jonah being disobedient and running from God. And then when he finally obeys God, he does it with a bitter and angry heart and neither is correct. God calls us not only to obey him, but obey him with the right heart. Ever seen someone both work at the same job, but both have different two attitudes? <laughs> you can tell the difference in how they work. You have one person who's thankful for the job, thankful, for, thankful to be there, you know? And then the other person right across from the, from the cubicle office, that person can be bitter, angry, hates his job, hates that he's here seven hours a day, five days a week, but they both still work. I want his church not only just to obey God, but also to obey him with a joyful heart. To say, God, I'm going to follow you willingly. I'm going to obey you willingly. I know that life is hard. Things may happen. Things may take place that I don't like, but I know if I continue to obey you, and continue to be aligned with your heart, that I will continue to grow my relationship with you and grow closer to know you and to spread your word and to spread the gospel all across the nations because that is what God has called us to do. And church, we have to start doing that with a joyful heart. I have to start doing that with a joyful heart. All of us do. This message is convicting because it's convicted me. This isn't a message of me telling you what to do. No, this is God telling us all what to do. And that's to obey with a joyful heart. And so that's my question to you right now is, in this moment in life, are you obeying God with a joyful heart? Maybe you are in a season right now when you've been just disobedient and maybe you've just been distanced. Maybe you're just following what you want to do, doing what desires that you want to do. You know, you just want to live your own life. Maybe you're in a season right now where you are obeying God, you are on the right track, but your heart is just not in the right place. 
you're almost obeying God as a checklist, like, oh, I have to do this, instead of having a willing and obeying heart. There's one comparison I do want to share when it comes to the story of Jonah. We've seen Jonah's heart and how he obeyed God with a bitter and angry heart. I want us to, just for a moment, also look at the contrast of Jesus' heart. When Jesus was about to be persecuted, whipped, put on the cross, and ultimately dying for our sins, he says the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is so honest and open in this prayer and shares that he really doesn't want to do this. But at the end of his prayer, he says, God, if it's your, if it's your will, let it be done. He obeys God with a joyful heart, not a happy heart. See, there's a difference. Happiness comes from happenings, you know, it comes from situations in life. Joyful is that inner peace, that inner joy that is telling me no matter what situation is happening, I know that my God is by my side. I know that my God is with me. And Jesus obeyed God with a joyful heart and says, I'm going to go on that cross and I'm going to die for all of these people's sins. Church, I want us to have Jesus' heart. Not like Jonah's heart, but like Jesus' heart. That we all start to obey with a joyful heart, no matter what situation that we're going through, no matter what next step in life we're gonna take. That our first response is to obey God and do it with a joyful heart. And after I, after I pray and close out the message, I would like for you personally to pray wherever you are. And say an honest prayer of where you are, maybe. Maybe you're in a season of disobedience. Maybe you're in a season where you are kind of obeying God, but you're really just checking it off the list. Wherever you are, I encourage you to have an honest conversation with God and say, God, Lord, please change my heart to obey you more. Change my heart for it to be joyful when I obey you. I'm going to pray, and after that, I'll just encourage you to do that. God, Lord, thank you so much for everything that you have done. God, Lord, I pray that in this moment right now that you would transform my heart to obey you with a joyful heart. God, I know that life gets tough and sometimes the unknown is scary, but God, Lord, please change my heart and change my ways, Lord, so that I can, I can obey you with a joyful heart, God, so I can continue to follow your will. And God, I also just pray for our church and the people listening online that they will be challenged with this message and really think to themselves right now in this moment, are they obeying you with a joyful heart? And I, pray that, I pray that they'll experience your love and they'll experience your peace, God, but I also pray that they'll experience the joy of obeying you and the joy of following who you are, God, because you're so perfect and you're so good. And God, Lord, I thank you so much for everything that you've done in my life for this church. God, well, I just pray for everyone this week that they will go out not forgetting this message or not just blowing past by another Sunday message, God, but they will really think to themselves of obeying you with a joyful heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, um, I hope that message speaks.